can't change anything, Abe. You know, all we can do is just go with what we are. You can't go with what you are. Have you read the papers? Do you know what everybody says? It's suicide. You've seen him. You know how strong he is. You can't win. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And, you know, last week, my good friend Ash and I had a really good conversation. And, and it, it seemed to really inspire people or, or maybe cause moments of self-reflection about how comic fans can sometimes, you know, be their worst enemy. And and one of my my friends on on YouTube had, had made a very good comment. I knew he had a channel of his own called Venom Blog. And, and see, you're here with me today. We're going to talk about how negative mindsets or, or maybe changing your mindset can give you a better comic book experience. Absolutely. And then Wes, again, thanks for having me, man. It's it's really cool to to talk to you on this show because I'm I'm actually a really big fan of yours, actually. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure, man. When I, we talked a little bit beforehand and you, you have an amazing story. We're not going to get into all the details because we don't sure. we don't have 45 minutes for the segment, <laughs> but I'm sure we're going to get a couple of details in there. But you're one of the world's biggest Venom fans. I mean, you, you have your own uh, YouTube channel specifically to the Venom character. What does Venom mean to you, brother? Well, you know, I, I've said this on the show before. What I, the reason? Two reasons I started the show. Maybe we'll get into one little bit about health and and you know what, what we love about comics. But the idea of Eddie Brock is um is a very relatable character to me in modern day. I look at Eddie Brock as a um, someone who was cancel cultured in a way. Uh, he was someone who wrote a story and it got the facts wrong and uh, all of New York hated him and it ruined his life and his career and he got fired, you know, because people demanded he got fired uh, because of a mistake he made. And after that, uh, he hit the bottom, you know, and uh, and was willing to, you know, commit suicide and go through all these really dark things that we do see in the news and in the world today. And when I saw that and I kind of, that was kind of my oversimplified interpretation of him, I guess, in a way, uh, but still him at his core, I was like, wow, I've been here and, uh, and I, I hate that I've been there. Um, so maybe, and then I'm a big fan of Tom Hardy. So he had just released a video at that time, like right around that time. Like I said, it was kind of cosmically happened where he released a video where he was training for the role of Venom and he put it up on YouTube. And I said, you know, I'll do a reaction video to that. Talk about what I love about Venom. Maybe it'll get me to start working out again, eat better. Um, it didn't really, <laughs> but I'm still working on that part. But, uh, but I looked at it as a way to therapeutically go through my own life and, um, talk about a character and an actor that I'm a big fan of. And that just steamrolled into talking about the comics, talking about toys and literally covering every single thing there is about Venom. So obviously, you know, Eddie Brock Venom is a very important character to you personally, but you're not exactly loving the current, you know, run of Venom by Donnie Cates. Uh, yeah, that's true. I guess that, yeah, that stems into why I commented on your last video, which was, uh, you know, the, the bad habits that we have are we our own worst enemies. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I wasn't really on board. I liked the first like a couple issues. I was really digging it. And then, um, as it progressed and as more layers got peeled back and as more concepts were being brought in, it, it felt, um, I don't know. I felt like I was losing my connection to the character in a way. And I was losing my connection to the, what I like about Eddie, what I like about the symbiote, their relationship. Um, I felt like uh, it went uh, back a couple steps. And I know every time a new writer comes in on a character, you kind of have to go back a few steps so you can give more room for the character to grow. Uh, but this didn't feel like a natural few steps back and it felt kind of abrupt. So I know a lot of people who are loving the Venom book maybe haven't been reading Venom uh, consistently throughout the years. Uh, there are some, there obviously there are some, uh, fans that have not, you know, stopped reading the book, but I, I noticed that a lot of these are new fans, which is great. Uh, you know, obviously that's what comics need and they struggle with is bringing in new fans. So to see new people talking about venom at the end of the day, I was like, yeah, you know, I may not like this, but it's so great to see so many people like it because all right, this is their venom. Um, this is their, you know, their big story, like Lethal Protector was for me. This is their big story that they are really digging. So eventually I just got to a point um, where I, I just had to learn to let go. And I think that was the biggest takeaway from my conversation or your conversation that you had in your episode with Ash was like, 
yeah, it, it's hard to let go. It's really, really hard to let go of these characters and you don't want to give them up for the next generation because in some level you're like, oh, they don't deserve it or they don't this or they don't that. And, and but it's it's not true. Like, you know, someone could have said that about you one day in the past when you got into comics that you didn't deserve, you know, that version of the character. Um, and of, I think you just got to at some point realize, you know, hey, it's not for me. Um, but as long as other people like it, that keeps the character alive. Yeah, because just because this isn't your Venom run doesn't mean in, in another year or two that there isn't going to be a new take on the character that isn't exactly for you. Exactly. I mean, that's the beauty of comics is every writer comes in and they'll do like a, you know, a one to five year run on a book and then they go on and do other things. And, and so and then another writer will come in and say, you know. I want to bring Venom back to basics. You know, I don't want to do God stories and big epics. I want to just do a guy who's struggling, who lives on the street, you know, and he has a son now, and I want to just tell those stories. And so, yeah, it's, I'm just, I just got to be patient sometimes with comic books. In fairness, I haven't read, obviously I haven't read Venom as much as you, but I, I have enjoyed Donny Cates' run. I, I do think it's kind of, petered off a little bit, but he did make a lot of changes to the character. All of a sudden he kind of made the, the Eddie Venom, relationship kind of like codependent where venom is kind of manipulating eddie by changing his memories and so he, he can't let go of venom and maybe realize that he has a son there waiting for him you know made memories of a sister maybe that didn't exist that died in a you know, i believe a car accident things of that nature so he really changed a lot about the core and the foundation of the character it's true i mean and and i do go back and forth because you know it's it's the story's not done so for all i know somehow null has been messing with the symbiote this whole time and caused it to pretend like it messed with venom's or eddie's memories i mean it, it, we could be in for a reveal for that at some point so you never really know um when it comes to this because writers nowadays i because we we talk about this on my show too where writers don't write for graphic novel anymore like i always see people go oh maybe it just doesn't work for you in single issue maybe switch to graphic novel and i say yeah but the days of Bendis and all those writers who write for graphic novel, that's over. Now most writers want to write for Omnibus. <laughs> and uh, and, <laughs> that's and, and true. They, they do. And they they just really stretch their stories out and they add ideas that really don't feel like they're going to pay off for like 20 issues. And then like 20 issues later, it's like, oh yeah, remember that thing I set up? Aren't I a genius? And you're like, no, you actually wasted like 40 of my dollars, you know, for buying all these issues or, or you know, whatever. So read some Claremont and find out what genius story <laughs> setting up is. You, know, you can do it in 40 issues, but tell, you know, 25 amazing stories in the meantime. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's uh, this, yeah, that decompressed, uh, you know, breakdown of characters is, is, and that's what Eddie's going through right now. It's like, it almost feels like a DC deconstruction of the character. And I know you got to deconstruct character sometimes, but to stretch it out for so long um, is just like, uh, okay, man, like just kind of, I, you kind of want people to get to the point, but they're too busy setting up other things. Like, all right, now it's, you know, it's going to tie into Thor most likely. Um, they're probably going to do a crossover with Thor and Venom you know, in an event book coming up most likely. Um, so it's like all this stuff is kind of predictable to an extent because I've, I've been reading comics 30 years. Uh, but yeah, when I see things like the sister, I'm like, I hope that's not true. I hope she's not really a gone character because even though she's only made like two or three appearances ever, I felt she was very vital. I always look at, you know, cause I'm a former comic writer and editor too. And I still write, you know, novels and stuff. I still try to look at things from a character standpoint. And so when you take something away, that's, that adds to the character. I don't understand. I, I, I rail against it naturally. So the sister, I'm like, well, in Dark Origin, the Venom Dark Origin comic by Zeb Wells, uh, I like that book, but a lot of my viewers don't. Uh, but my the reason I like it is because my takeaway from it is it it explains why Eddie Brock is not Peter Parker, why he doesn't have why he has a broken compass, moral compass, and it's because he had a father. He you know when he was born, his mother died in birth, and uh, and then he had a sister who blamed him for it. And then he had a father who was emotionally distant from him because of that death. And so Eddie was just born in a way to, to be this, you know, Oh, the, the gift of life, but at the same time caused a death. And he's this middle ground character uh, that, that has to bounce in the gray, you know, morally. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great takeaway. So to, to retcon his sister's abuse on him, is like, well, then why is he the way he is? <laughs> and why did the symbiote give him a sister in memory form to abuse him? Like, what's the point of that? Like, what does that gain for Eddie? Um, 
So it's just things like that where you just wonder on an emotional level and a character level why things are done. And that's why I'm hoping in the end it's not true and that she really did exist and it's just null somehow tampering with the symbiote. Well, it feels like the reason all this was done was so Dylan would end up being his son so he could have some codexes in him and become some type of symbiote demigod with all these weird powers that we don't really know what they are or where they come from. Yeah, and normally I'd be okay with uh, like, you know, okay, we want to bring in a son character because I'm like, because when I look at Donnie Cates, he's clearly just mimicking like all the writers he loves, you know, like Grant Morrison. So he's like, all right, let's give Venom a son like Grant did for Batman. Uh, let's uh, let's pace our story like Green Lantern, Jeff Johns run where we're now at the, you know, the, the Sinestro core war where it's Venom versus Carnage, you know, like Green Lantern versus Sinestro. And we're going to set that up, but we have Null out there and it looks like he might be able to bring back the dead and he has, you know, shadow creatures that fight for him. So it start. it's like, he's, he's kind of night. Yeah. Blackest night style. So you're kind of like, I was like, oh, I, I've I've heard this song before, just played by a better band, you know. Um, and uh, but I don't. It's like so my I don't hate the story. Uh, I think Donny Cates has a lot of great concepts. Uh, I just feel like sometimes his concepts are so big, he has trouble wording them, and because of that is why there's a disconnect with me as a reader with the story. Uh, so Dylan, for example, to me is just a plot device. Like he, I love the idea of giving Eddie a son because that adds some level of responsibility to Eddie, which he's never really had before on, on a, on this scale. So that's a great way to tell new stories. So as a concept, that's amazing. But then to reveal that Dylan is a demigod who just has the power to get them out of any situation. Whenever Donnie Cates writes himself into a corner, that's kind of like, all right, well then he's just a plot device and he's not a character at all. And he's not really adding anything to Eddie truly. Um, so that's why I, Again, and these are just my opinions, obviously, I, and I know I'm in the minority on them. So, because I do it on my show, and people are like, "Dude, like, you know, thumbs down," and I'm like, "I get it, <laughs> I get it. Uh, it's it's totally fine." But that's what I try to embrace other people's opinions, and I tell and I invite them, like, "Hey, in the comments, tell me why you think I'm wrong, or tell me what I overlooked, or I, you know, a, a story thread I missed, and why it's important, and and why you like it." And I I invite conversation for it. Um, I'm not here to like be like, well, this is my opinion. I'm the authority on Venom and screw all of you guys. It's not about that. It's like, we are Venom is the phrase that Venom says. So we all have to have a voice in, you know, in his character. So when I see majority of people love Donny Cates and stuff, I go, okay, well then I'm in the minority and this is your Venom and you guys please enjoy it. And don't let me be a sour puss about it. You know, that's actually one of the best things about having a YouTube channel is comic fans are so passionate and in, in them they're so invested into the medium and they love interacting and if you say something they don't like they're gonna absolutely let you know or okay. if they think you make a good point or maybe you you pointed something out that they didn't realize before they they absolutely let you know that you got it right that time and the, the interactions are absolutely the best part but you know sometimes the interactions could be a little bit uh, salty you know bordering on you know a little too far. I know that you're not really enjoying Donny Kate's run. Do you ever have the urge to maybe go online and, and let him know why, why he's doing it wrong? <laughs> oh no. Cause cause again, it's my opinion. I mean, I, I have, I think I've reached out to him like once or twice online. I, once I invited it, you know, like, Hey man, I know I'm, I don't know if you've seen my show, but I'm, I can be critical of you sometimes. And people have challenged me on that. And, uh, and so I would love to just maybe, have a conversation with you, you know, and, and kind of get your point of view. And he was like, yeah, sure. You know, DM me. And then, you know, and I did, and he, he never got back to me, but I, I don't think that was personal. I think he's just a busy guy. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just like, yeah, that's fine. It, you know, it, 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 I wasn't offended. I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, plus I don't really have the setup to, to really do an interview. I was just hoping to run into him in LA somewhere, but, uh, but yeah. So anyway, I, you know, or I guess my approach is not to tell him he's doing something wrong because the reason I don't do that is because it's my opinion and I a hundred percent aware that it's just my opinion. And, uh, and so I did reach out to him one time and say, why did you retcon, um, Eddie Brock having cancer? Uh, because as someone who goes through health issues, um, and I know there are people out there who are, you know, cancer survivors or still going through the, you know, the treatments who have read venom and identified with venom. Uh, I know because some of them have reached out to me on my show. So, it's such an important part of that character's history that is human. Um, so to say that he never had cancer. And then when I asked Donnie about it, his response was, well, the cancer was real to Eddie. And I'm like, well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> like, what do you mean it was real to Eddie? Because he had a memory <laughs> of it. Like, 
that the, so the so the symbiote imprint, imprinted a fake memory that Eddie had cancer. Then how did Eddie become anti venom? He had to really have had cancer in order to become anti venom because Mister Negative touched Eddie and his powers worked with the symbiote cells and codex, I guess, that was still inside Eddie and turned his cancer cells into anti-cancer cells. So it's like, so he had to have cancer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm kind of like, what do you mean it was real to Eddie? Uh, so those are just things like, and when he, you know, answers like that, I'm just kind of like, all right, dude, I get it. You're caught up in your own world and you're writing like four or five books, but I, I kind of wish you were just writing the one book that I want you to do a good job at <laughs> and not being like Brian Bendis, who just kind of like writes, you know, multiple books a month. Um, and only two of them are like quality books. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. So that's just, again, it's my opinion, but when I, so I did reach out to him just that one time about that, but it wasn't to say, Hey, you're doing this wrong. It was just, Hey, why did you retcon the cancer? And that was mm -hmm. it. But, but no, he's not really doing anything wrong. He's clearly doing something right. Cause the book is selling really well. And that's at the, as a fan of venom at the end of the day, that's all I care about is that people are talking about venom. And that's the, the healthy outlook and the healthy mindset when you're coming into it, just because, you know, obviously you see, see holes in, in his story. There, there's not everything adds up, you know, as cleanly as he would like, sure. you could definitely rail on it and you could, you could make a big deal out of it. You know, you, you've acknowledged it. You've, you've done the, the glasses half full kind of mentality and, and kind of moved on, on, on with your fandom. There's plenty of other stuff going on with Venom right now. We got, you know, the movie news going on. I, I, you know, probably some action figures, stuff like that. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, I cover, we just did the Funko pops that came out. There's a maximum venom animated series that starts in April on Disney XD. Um, there's a, I got to go to the set of venom two and, and hang out with Tom Hardy who knew who I was like, which was the, like the coolest thing ever. So, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I would say I'm not missing, uh, Rick, you know, uh, talking about <laughs> a, a run of comics that I'm not enjoying. Uh, I have plenty of other things to talk about that celebrate the character. And I'm very fortunate that the movie did so well, whether you like it or not, I'm glad it, it made almost a billion dollars, uh, because that provides me now with all this great topics and, and conversations to have with fans. So, and so I, I'm so grateful like that, that there's other stuff out there. When I talk to my wife about comics, mm -hmm. Sometimes she thinks I'm I'm nuts. She's like, <laughs> why are why are you getting emotional about this, Wes? It's like because it's important, and, <laughs> yeah. and it feels like like she can't um, relate to it. Sometimes, do you get that same interaction when you talk to people about comics? Like maybe why you're frustrated about what's happening in Venom, and and you get like that blank looks. Like it doesn't <laughs> yeah. seem like a big deal to me. I am. Um... I don't talk to a, a lot of people outside of my YouTube channel, except at work. But at work, I mean, I have a, a job. I'm talking about Lego, obviously. So I uh, I can't really dive into Venom too much, although we have Venom Lego. So that does give me <laughs> chances to talk about them. Um, but uh, yeah, every once in a while when I go to a comic store, you know, and I'll sit and if I have time, I'll sit and talk with the people that work there or someone else that just, you know, overhears our conversation and joins in. Um, I like getting that interaction. I like hearing what other people think. That's my big thing is, uh, is, is hearing what others think. It's like, uh, my show is it's, it's, a, it's, it's 500 episodes almost of me telling you what I think. So I really do try to invite other people of what they think. So, um, yeah, I, I do get that look sometimes, but yeah, I guess we, you know, I, I just tell them why it's important to me. Like if they ask, I, if they go like, Hey, well, why is this stuff so important to you? You seem very passionate about it. Um, I, I tell them, but rarely do I get that question. Most people just go, okay, he clearly <laughs> like, <laughs> he, he knows this stuff and he loves it. Uh, so, uh, and he has a passion for it. And, um, so yeah, no, I, I, but I do get those stares sometimes. I com I completely know what you're talking about. And, uh, and I, I welcome those stares cause I'm like, well, tell me something now of yours that would make me look at you that way. And, uh, and I try to reciprocate, you know, so they, mm -hmm. they know what it's like. We, we, you have mentioned the, the medical thing, and, and we, we've talked about why, why you are a very passionate comic book fan, but there's a really good reason for it. And you know, you told me your story earlier, and I don't want to get into all the details because there, it, it is a bit, bit of a sad story, but I, I want to highlight the, the really positives that came out of it. You know, you had a life threatening issue that happened where I, I guess you had a brain aneurysm and, like yeah, you will, basically um, were a non-functioning person. Like you couldn't speak you, you, and you lost a lot of memories and things, correct? That's right. Yeah. It's a, so a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it's kind of, it's a brain aneurysm rupture. So people can have brain aneurysms and get them coiled, which I, I have done since as well. Uh, but, uh, 
and that kind of prevents, you know, or is meant to prevent the aneurysm from rupturing. But when a aneurysm actually ruptures, it's like a, a small grenade going off in your head. And a lot of people do die from it. It affects a, a lot of people. It's one in 50 people uh, nowadays. So it, it's definitely increased. And, uh, and so what happened to me was I survived, I think pretty much because my age, I was 28 at the time. So it was about 10 years ago. And I had to spend time in physical therapy and speech therapy afterwards. Um, I couldn't remember my mom. I couldn't remember my brother. Um, there was a lot of gaps. Uh, the few memories I had seemed to be more recent and they were in California because that's where I was living before it happened. And now that's where I'm living now, but I'm about to move. And, um, you know, for these same health reasons, uh, you know, I've, I've basically been putting, I've been pushing myself, you know, I, uh, these past few years, but, uh, you know, ignoring disability, feeling like, no, I can work, I can do things, I can talk. Like people always say, oh, you look so normal. So I'm like, well, let's, let's be normal. Let, let's, you know, because a, a lot of times when people have head injuries and they don't show something, like I meet aneurysm survivors all the time. I used to be in a group where we talked to them and there'd be people who couldn't move the left side of their bodies. There are people who still can't talk, you know, there, there so many things. So when I saw that I was, that I was doing better, I said, well, I should then speak for the people who can't speak. I should try to mention this when I can and get awareness out there uh, because there are people who are hurting from it. And the weird thing is, like you mentioned, I couldn't remember my mom and my brother, but for some reason I could remember that Peter Parker was Spider-Man. <laughs> and, uh, and so once I, once the gravity of that hit me, like, Oh, I know who Optimus prime is. And I know who, you know, Venom is, and I know who Superman is and he's Clark Kent. Like to have those, that knowledge over memories was, a uh, was such a weird, uh, revelation, but it, it was one that led me to come back to California and try to pursue work in comics because yeah, that's how important comics are to me. They survived um, a grenade, you know, <laughs> in my brain that, that my own childhood memories that probably define me as who I am as a person couldn't survive. Uh, so yeah, when there's real power to comics, like literally power to comics uh, because of how, and I know it helped you through tough times. So it's, and it's at so many people, you could talk to almost any fan and they'll tell you some tragic story where they how they got into comics and why it's so important to them and that is why uh comic books matter and that's why we all fight so hard f to have our voices heard of ways to maybe save the industry and help out where we can you know yeah and people act like it's you know you're you're being irrational i'm not i'm not being irrational i'm being passionate and when, when i heard your story and you know you're going through your recovery and basically the the one touchstone to your past you know when that moment was comic books it was yeah. peter parker spider-man you know, it was Superman. Those are the things that 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 let you know that that there was something there for you to go and discover. And it, that just it really touched me. Uh, very sorry. That's OK. It really touched me, man. It was, it was really inspirational. And uh, it because I feel like I feel that way about comics, too. But, you know, it, to you is even more special because it got you through your recovery. It helped you learn to speak again. It helped you to walk again, you know, probably helped you with your um when you started reforming your relationships with, with the, with the people that you lost in, you know, in your memories, you know, your mother and the rest of your family members and, and, you know, comic books helped you help get you there. Yeah. They were, they were the foundation. Like my mom, one thing we used to do, she would, t you know, she tells me this, uh, but she was like, when, when you were in high school, we would go toy hunting together. We would look for the latest series of spawn figures or, you know, when the prequels for star Wars came out, we would look for those figures together. So now I, I, you know, when she told me that I said, mom, I'm looking for this figure. Will you help me find it? You know? And, uh, it was a way for us to kind of reconnect. Um, cause nothing hurts more. I mean, I mean, a lot of things hurt more, but I guess in some ways with parents, every parent, when they talk to you is, Hey, remember when you were this, you know, you were five and you did this or remember that's everything to parents. So when my mom couldn't do that to me anymore, it, it was, it was really hard for her. Um, to go like, Oh, remember in high school when you did this, it's like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know? Um, so it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, I have faked it a few times, you know, for her benefit, like, I'll be like Oh yeah, I kind of remember that, you know, cause I'm just tired of seeing the heartbroken look on people's faces. So you kind of develop these, these things, but of like how to converse with people and, and what triggers them to be sad. You try to do the opposite now, or I try to do the opposite now. And, um, 
Yeah. And so comic books, yeah, they helped me reconnect to a lot of stuff in my life. And, and that's why, that's why I'm passionate about them for sure. And I know, like you said, Rob Venditti was like your favorite writer because of your, your connection to comics and, and, and what it meant for you at, at a very critical time. Uh, same with me. I, of all comics to come out when I was recovering, it was brightest day and uh, right, written by Jeff Johns and Pete Tomasi and everyone else. And that, that book was about people getting a second chance. And I remember reading it going, what are the odds <laughs> that, that, uh, that Green Lantern, who's my favorite superhero of all characters, I'm like, what, uh, what are the odds that the guy who was writing Green Lantern is now writing a story about people getting a second chance right at the moment that I'm getting a second chance? Um, it was, uh, it was again, again, cos cosmically linked. Uh, so to me, comics are as part of my DNA as anything. And that's proof in the fact that I could remember them over real memories. And so, yeah, they're always going to be important to me. Uh, and I'm always going to voice my opinions on them, whether people agree with them or not. But I also, also hope that only invites conversation and not arguments. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, man. Just a, a wonderful story. I, I'm glad that you're you're so invested in Venom. You're out there for the community. You're out there for the fandom. So they have a place to go to. They can get all their Venom news, their Venom opinions and stuff like that. You know, I do something uh, very similar on this channel. And uh, hopefully I can get you, you know, maybe you can come back tomorrow. We can do like a top five Venom stories of all times or something. I would love that. Holy cow, I would love that. All right, let's do it. It's a date. <laughs> all right. Great. I'm off tomorrow. I'm all yours, man. <laughs> All right. Well, Seek, thank you so much for joining the channel, uh, you know, sharing your story, sharing your love for Venom and how you uh, are able to overcome a run that maybe isn't your run, but but keeping a, a positive outlook and, and keeping or understanding that better days are coming tomorrow. Is there any last thing that you would like to say to the viewers before we wrap this up? Um, I would just say, you know, if, if you liked our conversation here, yeah, definitely check out my channel. But um, if you're from my channel and you're watching this, subscribe to Wes. Uh, he has a lot of great stuff. He has a lot of great guests, great conversations, very insightful stuff on the comic industry from industry insiders and people who worked in the comics industry. So, I mean, if I could do a commercial for your show, uh, that's what I want to do because uh, it is that this listening to you and the stuff you guys talk about is just so awesome every single day. So keep up what you do, Wes. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to talk to you tomorrow. Awesome. We'll see you then.